what's missing curfew. It's when you kind of play guilty, but you show up. How nice is a green light on the road, though? No practice tomorrow, no playing, just go. Scotty Upshaw in the clear, and he scores! One in front, scores! A few laughs, a little bit of fun, and obviously a lot of hockey talk. You're listening to Missing Curfew. With our lads. Fella Friday, up go! My man, Fridays are fun! Hot We're going to be, when this airs, this is the magic of technology and having your own studio thanks to Hall Pass Media. When this airs, you'll be drunk at Edmonton. Friday morning. Yeah, you, know, <laughs> Friday well, you won't be hungover. Well, I'll you be don't... heading to play golf at a little place called Belvedere Country Club. Is yeah, that a good yeah. track? Yeah, it's a nice track. East side. Belvedere. Belvedere. I do like Belvedere vodka. I used to <laughs> yeah, chug that. I used to chug that out of the bottle. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure you wouldn't... Uh... You you wouldn't mind drinking any. Kind who's uh who's a member at Belvedere? Uh Jesse. I mean buddy Jesse's we're going up to the game. Is Blado playing with you? Uh I t- yeah, a little maybe last minute invite to Stewie, yeah. Oh you haven't <laughs> No, I haven't invited him. You haven't invited I've him. I've had so much shit on the go, as you know. Yeah. So yeah, you okay. wouldn't want to bring ben, Blano in there as your partner and fucking just go to town. Yeah, because yeah. he's I'll bring Blano. Blano's the guy, isn't he? Yeah. Is he is he still like just a stick? He's a stick. Yeah, that, that some things don't change. The yeah. fact that Blaine kicks my ass every time I play golf with him. So no Blackhawk, Belvedere. No, we're not gonna play Blackhawk. I'm staying on the east side. What does that mean? What is I'm, I'm staying kidding. over the east side. Uh, Where's that? Like White Ave or no? No, it's up near like Sherwood Park. Um, like so, it's you know not so much Fort Saskatchewan where our boy Loops is from. Just a little east of there. Oh, so you're out of the city. Yeah, I'm not staying out of the city. See, staying staying out on a farm for two days. Well, really? You don't have a hotel no, room downtown? I do not. I think you should find I might go Saturday night because I'm going out early Sunday. So that's probably Saturday night is my night to let her rip. So Thursday night, go to the game. Uh, Oilers are probably going to win game three if, if you go by the book. Then what, back to the ranch or no? no downtown. I'll probably go Buck Diddy downtown and then meet back at the ranch later. Now, the guy you're going with, what, Jesse? Yeah. Does he like to get after, of course? Yeah, but yeah, he's a little, I, I'd say he's probably more low-key than than you. Than me, yeah. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, shout out to Tyson Berry and uh, <laughs> yeah. Chaser from, uh, no, Chaser, Casey from Greta. They're like, uh, up dog, if you want to come by Thursday, let us know. We're ready to go, where are you at? You're like right beside the pipe. I'm like, up dog, you know where that is. They kicked you out of there last time we were up there for the foul. Oh, they did, didn't they? They kicked us both out. I know. I said, we're leaving. We're fucking leaving, all right? Leave or leave it. We don't even want to be here. We ain't coming back. Yeah. I think we did something stupid probably. (laughs) Uh, Anyways, fellas, um, this will be coming out. The Updog will be up there in oil country enjoying it. Updog, game two. 3.6 million people watched it on ESPN. That is great for hockey. That's a credit to Steve Levy, uh, Mark Messier, PK, Bucci. um, And and, and most importantly, the players, man. That's a feather in their cap. No, and, and the pregame show was great, the point. And then I thought, like, leading up to the game, they sh- they highlighted just how great, you know, the Florida Panthers organization is, all the buzz around the city for, you know, for their second Stanley Cup final in as many years. And, you know, when you got the best player, arguably the best two players, and maybe you throw Barkoff in there as well, three in the world, you know, why not highlight and have all these, you know, these fans tune in? Because the hockey's great and the atmosphere is great. I can't wait to get in this building. It's going to be incredible, but... Uh, the game's growing, and as we know, you know, salary cap talk all week and stuff going up next year. It's just uh, things are on the up and up, and that's good because we want to see these guys get paid more, and we want to see the fans start to, you know, new fans come enjoy hockey. Stanley yeah, Cup finals are here. I didn't know how it would how it would be viewed down here because you know of the Edmonton Oilers, and they do have the two two well the best player on the planet, and then Dry Settle right there behind them. But I want to give some credit to Matty Kachuk too, being a U.S. board player, great in the media. Always says the right thing. Uh, always, you know, I saw him on McAfee yesterday. Uh, last year when they were in the finals, he went on, you know, NBA, TNT. Like, I just think Chucky does a great job, and he has grown the game in America. And people are tuning in because he's an American board player. His old man's a legend. And let's get her going. You yeah. know I mean, I think, I think Chucky being such a good player and a good person helps those ratings too, man. Yeah, it's, you know, one thing is calling Big Walt a, a legend, but right now, I'm Matty Kachuk, what he's done, you know, I, I haven't looked at Keith's stats his first maybe 10 years in the league, but Matty Kachuk, is, he, he's arguably one of NHL's most did decorated media people that yeah. we have, and he backs it up with, you know, with a Hart Trophy cal- uh, caliber season last year, bleeding his team to the finals. Um, a guy that, you know, at the start of this year played played hurt, um, you know, broken sternum in the finals last year, and now, now as he's a healthy guy and you listen to him, 
Um, you know, what he says to about his team, what he says about this opportunity that lies ahead for them, only two wins away from a Stanley Cup championship, it's, you know, it's a guy that, that is, is cherishing this moment and cherishing this moment for his organization, for his team, and for, you know, for his personal yeah. accolades. And, and, and you know what, he'll, he'll, he'll take on any role, right? Like, he, oh, yeah. he, he all year he's... You know, you said he was you know, came back from injury. He struggled. He didn't put up the you know the points he did last year. None none of that mattered to him. He had one thing on his mind to get back to where they are now, yeah. and their whole team. I mean, you know, we'll see the series is like we said you know earlier in the week. It's not over. We'll see how what takes place in Edmonton. But um, one thing we talked about was you got to have a bird that can get you all the way from Edmonton to fucking Florida without yeah. having fuel up. Well, the cats. They had to stop in Kansas City, and they couldn't get out of Florida today. This is we're recording on Wednesday, fellas. They couldn't get out because of storms. They had to stop in Kansas City. You were shocked that they were leaving the day. Shocked. Yeah. I'm. Uh, well, I understand not going into the belly of the beast. Like, yeah. Edmonton is the beast right now. Right now. You cannot. There's going to be fire alarms pulled at your hotel. There's going to be chicken that's not cooked properly. Exactly. There's going to be hard pasta. It's uh, You know, there's going to be some... I'm just saying that that's just the mind mind warfare that's, that's so to be true. played within Edmonton. You can't trust anybody at those hotels. You, you've got to be bringing your own food, your own drinks. I you don't want to be eating the ice in the hotel. I, mean, I bet you they had this conversation with these guys. 100%. I bet you they said, "Fellas, careful ordering room service." You know, we yeah. got team meals, team meals that yeah, they're going to watch. Bringing our own chef. Yeah, I would. Man. Yeah, watch what goes in there. Next thing you know, the boys got the shits. They can't <laughs> play like. These these greasy Oilers fans, they they know that it's desperate times. They'll do whatever it takes. But but we did talk about this. I, I did mention, and you said there's they got to get a bird that can go the whole way. I don't know bird. if they're not flying on a global. So I think did the Oilers make it the whole way? Well, there, there's no. I guess you can fly Edmonton to to Cancun. So yeah, I guess. But but up against the wind, that's a long that's a long flight. That's a long flight, but there's birds out there that can make it. You gotta, you're, you're right. Okay, so so unless cross want, that off. Unless you want the boys just to get off and stretch the legs, you're like, all right, boys, let's get off here yeah. and city stretch the legs. But for me, if I'm the GM or owner, Vinny Biola, I'm like, get me the plane that gets the boys there safely, obviously, and just without stuff. This is five and a half, six hour flight, like, your legs are a little cramped up, no? Or you know what? Maybe you don't want to stop to just right, no, lock it out. Yeah, that's something. And then, like, let's talk about this. Going in the day before, when you have three days, there's, you know, there was three days in between, right? So you're going in the day before, to me, is nuts. I think you got to get at least halfway I was shocked up. Maybe too. you stop in Calgary. Maybe you go into okay. Calgary. What about, uh, get up Calgary? What about, or you could just stay in Kansas City. They got a rink there. You could have a skate there, have yeah. some fucking barbecue, break out totally. the Tums, <laughs> fucking head back on the bird. Or you could have stopped. Cheese. You said Denver, but that, the altitude is what may be yeah. tricky. You know, you, you get into altitude, might fuck with your lungs a little bit. Do you remember that flight? Speaking of long flights, I, we were part of the Florida Panthers. Do you remember our flight from Washington to Vancouver? Yeah, I do. Fuck, were we drunk coming off of that plane? Yeah. Uh, that's not as how far that one's up there, too. That's, that, that's as far as you get to, yeah. Yeah, and we didn't have to stop for fuel. Not that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> we, might, we, might, <laughs> we might have stopped. Hey, boys, did we just stop? Uh, hey, did you see the thing about um, they asked the, the Florida Panthers, you know, who you sit beside? And yeah, um, they all play poker. Yeah. Chucky, Monty, Eki, Bennett, Alcaposa. Yeah. Like they got a team. Like when I heard that, I'm like, oh, I like these guys even more. They're playing poker on the bird. So that's maybe one legacy I left behind in Florida. Uh, there was a, there was a great poker. <laughs> you left a couple others. You, le- <laughs> <laughs> you left a couple other. You left a couple other things behind in Florida too. But yeah, legacy is definitely one, definitely one of them. But um, I just thought, man, I miss playing poker on the bird. Yeah, it's right. Tough. That's any yeah. bad way. Do is bet on these games. I, I remember, <laughs> yeah, I know. I remember like my time in Vancouver. Like down the road, didn't really hang out with anyone at home. Everyone was married with kids. Like where I got to know my teammates the most was battling, obviously the dressing room, but then on the plane, playing yeah. cards with Bexa and Burroughs and Willie Mitchell and Hordachuk and, and Adler and uh, Michael Gra- Like that's where you get to know these guys and you build a brotherhood. Like say what you want about it, but I think playing poker is huge. And when I heard that the Florida Panthers are playing poker, are the Oilers playing poker? They gotta be, right? Yeah. Have you heard anything? Have you? Heard- I haven't. No, I haven't. Good, good, but a hundred percent. Does Connor play poker? You think? Leon, I, Leon, Leon's looks like a guy playing, in poker. Yeah, Leon looks like a guy that plays poker. Kane's playing poker. I a hundred percent. Ekholm's playing poker. Skinner's playing poker. What about Ryan Nugent Hopkins? If he was, he'd be a good poker player. He looks like he's strategic like that. Bouchard, probably not. No, Bouchard's he's, playing he'd be video easy games. Money. Actually, you know what? Actually, that's the guy you want to play in it. 
I think Teddy Purcell told me that Bouchard was a beauty. Remember we played golf? Yeah, I'm sure he's a beauty. Yeah, to so me, he seems like he's easy money. And he's he's going to be making banks, so he's the one you want in the poker game. Who was the easiest, worst player you've ever played with? Uh, well, Toots was, but we called him Bet and Toots. He yeah. lose all the time, but. He was just aggressive. It wasn't for a lack of just, you know, he had balls. Yeah. Um, easy money. Darcy Hornchuk. Joe was a good, pretty good poker player. I was probably, Arnie people has, would probably say me. I, I Paul wasn't Korea, very, Paul Korea, uh, as you know, um, Louie was great. Uh, Darian Hatcher was a good Louis, poker player. Louie was good, but Louie was such Slow a, play. he was such, he was, I'm like, Lou, are you going to play a hand? Yeah, I know. Like, get in there. Chris Barsh was easy money. He didn't make much money, but yeah. he was easy money. I remember I'll never forget Horner Chuck. We had the mother's trip. He like he had to borrow money off his mom. I think he actually asked his mom yeah. for some money to buy back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Harton was good. Kimo team was good. Loops player. a good poker player. Loops is a great poker player. Yeah. Like, and he's got the balls. best. And he's and he's got puck luck. He's got diamond hands. Oh, he's got, yeah. What was the game we played heading over to, to Ireland though? Uh, MJ's game. Yeah, that Loops was a card stud. He was getting, we getting work. We bent him over. He yeah, was down. No, we didn't even play. He's like, is this a real game? Yeah. Like MJ plays it, but it's got to be a real game. Um, up dog, I missed the bird. Uh, although I probably wouldn't miss that play from Edmonton to Vancouver. But hey, Panthers, if it goes back, if you got to go back there for game six, get a bigger bird, eh? Up dog. That's right. We'll be right back here at Missing Curfew. <laughs> Welcome back to Missing Curfew. Up dog. Bella. Team Canada, Four Nations. Get these guys a Labatt Blue. Presented by Labatt Blue Light, the Prestine Pilsner. Enjoy your beers together so you can live life to the power of weed. Always enjoy responsibly. Beer. Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. All right, up dog. Six guys are going to be announced June 28th. Uh, which are your six guys? Get these boys Labatt Blue. Who, if you were Don Sweeney, who I didn't even know was a GM of the team. Good job by you. Uh, I always thought Don Sweeney was American for some reason. Hang in there, Obes. Who are your top six guys June 28th? Get these boys in Labatt Blue. Well... Four guys off the six hop. guys. I know, but the four guys. I mean, come okay, on. Okay, yeah, yeah. Look at down the look at down the point here as center. You got Connor McDavid, number ninety seven. You got number twenty nine, McKinnon. You are gonna enjoy for the first time watching this guy play with McDavid, who is number eighty seven, Sidney Crosby, generational player. So you got those three guys, and then Kale McCarr for me is a, just a no brainer, best defenseman in the world. Uh, so okay, so you have those four. Yeah. Two now more. I'm gonna go off the beaten path here for you. All right. Okay. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take Alex Petrangelo, and I'm gonna take Connor Bedard. Six guys. You're fucking David Bedard on your on your six. Eh? I'm gonna Guy say. To have a fucking... I'm gonna say Bedard is gonna play with McKinnon. How's that? That's gonna be my I, I, that's my guess right there. Well, we'll get into that. Let me let me let me dish <laughs> out let me dish out my blue lights before. I, I just didn't want to take the same as you because I know uh, you're gonna go hey, off. Hey, 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 hey. I'm gonna go McDavid, McKinnon, Crosby yeah. down the pipe like the updog. Then I'm gonna give some love to Sam Reinhart. Rhino, he's in the Stanley Cup Finals. He yeah. scored 54 goals. He's gonna get absolutely paid. And then obviously Kale McCarr, and I'm gonna go with his D partner Devon Taves as my six guys. Get those boys a Labatt blue. Get them a Labatt blue light. Connor Bedard. Ready, folks? Connor Bedard is not in my top. He's not in my top twelve, fella. So you're gonna, so yeah. Listen, I just I'm, I'm gonna tell you what about Connor Bedard. This yeah, is what. Just tell me who you're taking instead. This is what I'm gonna do. Connor Bedard. It's 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 the Caitlin Clark treatment, right? Caitlin Clark didn't make Team USA. Which is it's a joke. It's stupid. You have her on the team because she's gonna generate a buzz. Connor Connor Bedard is gonna make the team because he's Connor Bedard. And he's going to get in some games, <clears throat> but he will not play in the championship game. He will not be in the top so you twelve. Say you make the team. They're going to have him on the team for experience, but okay. he's not going to be playing on Nathan McKinnon's. He's line. already going to have a year and a half under his belt. No, he's not just a rookie. He's a fucking rookie puke still. He's until, not until he plays another whoa, game. Whoa, whoa, he's whoa. a rookie puke in my opinion. He, he, I mean, he almost got. You, you almost lost your bet, right? Did you lose a bet? I didn't. I won my Bedard bet. Okay, you won the Bedard bet. But how many goals did he get? Twenty. He scored... Uh, he got like, what, 22? Yes. Okay, so anyway, but he's not going to be a rookie anymore, and he still has not played in an NHL game with good players. Not one. You make a great point. I, I, I would love to see him play with McKinnon or McDavid or Crosby. I imagine he played with a guy that actually carries the play and that feeds through that other guy instead of... I, I just think they're they're crazy not to give him a look, 
Well, he's going to see get... what kind of chemistry he has with these guys because arguably, like, no, whether he deserves it or not, he's probably just as skilled or better than 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 the fucking top. You know, there's going to be six guys there that are better than him, and then it's arguably like he's like Sam Reinhart and him. Sam Reinhart hasn't had a breakout season since last year. Reinhart scored 54. Yeah, but playing with Barkov and fucking Verhey. Yeah, well, right here he's going to be playing with Crosby. I'm sure he can rip those one-timers home. But too. yeah, but I mean, I'm just saying. No, no, Wait no. until he gets I, a I, chance. I, no, listen, you. I don't know who loves Bedard more, you or Luke. But an it's NHL close. scout right now say, I, I, want, I want Connor Bedard or Reinhardt on my team for next year. Next year? Next year in the NHL. Reinhardt. He really scored 54 goals. You would rather take Sam Reinhart than Connor Bedard. Sam Reinhart in, in an prime. NHL season. For one season? One season. Yeah, I take right Reinhart now. for sure. Okay. But Reinhart's a winger. Bedard's a center. I know. But so have- Bedard's going to be on the wing because look, on this projected Four Nations Cup, yeah. it's McDavid, McKinnon, Crosby Point. Yeah. Now, I'm going to make another statement here. I'm missing curfew. I don't know who the coach is going to be. I think it should be John Cooper. I hope it's John Cooper. To me, I'm going to put Point on the wing. And my fourth line center, no matter who the fuck is the coach, Ryan O'Reilly is my fourth line center. I I, I like that. That is I, just I who my fourth line center you is. You need him in the dressing room. You just need him. He's a fourth line. And you need him to snap the draws center. back. Yes. Now, when you look at this team, to me, you know, if you want to look pull up Team USA's projected lineup, like you're going to need some 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 PK guys, and maybe I'm biased because it's fact daddy, but I would put Poy on the wing, and then there's rumors of. You know, do you put McDavid and McKinnon together? Do you try McKinnon on the right side? Now, if that happens, then maybe you slide Bedard in there. But to put Bedard on the wing, I, I don't know. I, I just, I mean, we're talking about Team Canada here. The, the kid's going to be a stud. I get it. But we're talking about Team Canada here. Let me ask you this. Do you think they just bring the whole Oilers top line, McDavid, Hyman, and Nugent Hopkins as, the, as, a, as a line? I don't think Nugent Hopkins makes the team. I think, I think Hyman's a good does. penalty killer. I think... I think he deserves a, a chance to look at it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I also say but, but it's a good point. I, I don't know. Would you take Would you take Stone or would you take Nugent Hopkins? Like for overall, like I you want Stone. I, I would PK? take I would take Stone because he's a right handed shot. But I don't think Stone makes the team either. Okay, and now for the listeners out there, we, we might be rambling on, but right now a projected lineup of of what I have in front of me. Think of these right handed wingers: Stamkos, Hyman. Marner, Reinhardt, Stone, Bedard, Marsha Schott, fucking, then you put Barzell in there. You, like, there's they're all right handed guys. We, yeah. We're struggling to find a left handed <laughs> yeah, guy. We're all lefties. Shifley, Robert Thomas. Like, you, fuck. God, okay. There's no left handed wingers. No shit. The only left handed wingers right now is Marshawn and Marshawn. That's it. There's only Marshawn. That's, That's a left handed fucking winger. So I think, you know, Crosby maybe goes to the wing. I think, I, why not? It's fucking So Crosby look at this. McDavid's a lefty, Marshawn's a lefty, Crosby's a lefty. That's the only lefties on this team. So here's the projected lineup that Princey or Kyle found for us. Stamkos, McDavid, Hyman, Marshawn, McKinnon, Marner, Reinhardt, Crosby, Stone, Bedard, Point, Marsha Schull. I don't know why I don't think Marsha Schull's not on the team either. Marner, he's not guaranteed on the fucking team. No. I would take Marner out of there and I would slide Reinhardt up there I would go Marshawn, McKinnon, Reinhardt, and I got Crosby. And I need some wingers for Crosby. I, I, I need really, some wingers for. Crosby. I really think right now, if if next season continues to go the way this season has gone, Nugent Hopkins makes this team with McDavid and Hyman. That's 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 the first line. That's then the first line. Then you go. Yeah, I'm just saying that line. You don't even have to think about. These guys know how to play hockey. They're fucking the Stanley Cup final currently. It's just it, it, to me, it would be. You don't even have to think about that. They already know each other. They're fucking good. Then <laughs> O'Reilly. They already know each other. They're fucking good. And then O'Reilly, you put him in because he's a left-handed draw, and he's just going to be, you know, whether he plays or he doesn't, he can. he's just right there. I think Point can play the wing. I, I, I The way that Point can play and protect the puck on the wall and, and get his boots moving, I, 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 got, I got no Point moving Braden Point over to the wing. But there are just a young kid putting him on the wing. I'm sure he can handle it. Listen, you're going to be right. They're going to, there's no way they're leaving the kid off the team. No, but no, no, let no. me say, do you think Connor Bedard yeah. will make an impact in the Four Nations Cup? 100% if he plays with a great player. You do. He's fast. I don't. He think sees he the ice well. It's a, it's a moment where he's going to... I don't know. I actually... Did you get the chance to watch him at the World Championships? I didn't. No, I didn't watch would have had a chance to play with I didn't him. watch any of that. I, I know Team Canada didn't you know didn't play the way, the way they did, but... Um, I did see a lot of Brady Kachuk 
uh, highlights from the world championship yeah. though. Brady well, was like fighting guys or trying to fight guys. It was great. For a minute, okay, we talked a lot about the forwards. Let's talk about the D. Sure. And this is right up your wheelhouse. Um, do you go, the Canada's always like to do left-handed, right-handed. OB, it's just the way they've been. Yeah. It's always been like their MO at World Juniors and World Championships, the whole thing. So uh, so you got Makar, you have I got, you have Taves. Yes. You know, let's just start with those two, and then where else I'll give do you, you put some I'll guys? Give you my, I'll give you my guys right now, okay? So I got Taves and Makar as my top pair. Okay. I got Morgan Riley. And Petroangelo as my second pair. Yeah. And then my third pair, I got the fucking beauty, Drew Doughty, just because he's a fucking beauty. Yeah. And Josh Morrissey. And then my 7-8, I mean, you can pick whoever you want, really. But Bouchard, my, I say Bouchard and, and uh, Bouchard, Vince Dunn or Hamilton? Because, well, actually, Doug, Dougie, you, didn't play, Dougie Hamilton didn't play last year. I mean, yeah. Evan Bouchard's going to get a look, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Hey, listen, this Dobson from the Islanders has an absolute bomb as a right-handed shot. Okay, right, so a lot shot. of right-handed shots again here. So Taves, McCarr, lefty-righty. Yep. Morgan right. Riley, Petro, lefty-righty. Uh, Doughty and Morrissey, Morrissey lefty-righty. Lefty I like that. That's my top six as of right now. But listen, a lot of things are going to change, right? There'll be injuries. Guys are just going to step up. And when you talk about Bedard, you're right about him playing with other players. And it's going to be, you know, is he healthy? And what type of year he's having too, right? Totally. Yeah, it's going to come down to somebody who's going to come out of the gates next year. Maybe Reinhardt cools off next year. Maybe he gets 10 and bananas a year. And what if he signs in, like, Columbus for 10 bananas a year and doesn't play with the players that he's playing with currently? And he has an off year. <laughs> well, you like shit on Columbus, eh? No, listen. <laughs> Re- Reinhardt, Re- listen, Reinhardt's not, I mean, Reinhardt is not guaranteed on the team by any stretch. Yeah, of I'm just saying no. Reinhardt's had two great years, and so has Hyman. But if Hyman doesn't play with McDavid and Reinhardt doesn't play with Barkov, are they having 50 goal years? Probably not. Arguably not. I'm going to go an honorable mention to Brandon Montour. Yeah. I I, I, I think you could put Brandon Montour in the mix there too. Yeah. Hell yeah. For for sure. Yeah. I love Monty's game. But, 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 but what about the last thing here before we head to our guest up, dog? Power play one. Power play one for Team Canada. McDavid, McKinnon, Crosby, McCarr, and then Stammer. Uh, I mean, I'm putting Hyman in front of the net. You're putting Hyman. Okay, I, I, how do I argue that the guy had 50 fucking seven goals or so, something? So, and McCarr is the only defenseman on the ice. Obviously. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's McKinnon, McCarr, McDavid up top, and then I have Where do you Crosby, Crosby. Crosby on the goal line. Yeah. Yeah. So That's you got so sick. You know so you got you got awesome. hold on, hold on. So watch. you got one, two, three, four. Yeah. So you got Hyman, McDavid, McKinnon, Crosby, McCarr. Yeah. I should be coaching the team. That's, I, that's who that's who's out there. Don't come off. I got big score. I'm gonna go McDavid, McKinnon, Crosby, McCarr, Stammer for one time city yeah. over there. But you do need an F front guy. You do need an F front guy. But the only problem with this Crosby can stand is McCarr is is McKinnon and McDavid. They do the same thing on the power play. They wheel, oh, but they're going to be on the same. They're going to be opposite sides. I hope so. Yeah, left and right, and they're going to just be circling the goddamn wagons. <laughs> yeah, fucking the course. <laughs> it's going to be chaos, man. Yeah. I can't wait to watch it. We're going to go. Let's. Where do we want to go? Boston or Montreal or both? I like Montreal better than Boston. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plus, we got a guy. We got a guy in Boston. We've been dodging for last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, it's great for hockey. Uh, Bedard, I'm sorry, I'm a little crusty vet, but I still treat you as a rook. Uh, I'm sure you're going to prove me wrong. I'm sure you're going to prove me wrong. I think you're great. I can't wait to see 97 with a fucking Canada jersey on. It's been way too long. Yeah. This is going to be a great tournament. It should be the Six Nations, but unfortunately it's the Four Nations. Up Dog, our guest coming up is brought to you by DraftKings Fella. Presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned, fellas, because you'll hear more about DK and all it has to offer throughout our show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Absolute beauty, a great get here by the Updog, Louis DeBrusque, coming at you next. Uh, welcome back to Mr. Curfew, Updog, uh, big fan of this guy, uh, love, like I said, I've watched, I watched probably 70 of 82 of those games this year, uh, I love the broadcast, I love the way this guy played, you reached out and got him, so I'm excited about this guy. Yeah, I, I remember too in training camp when I was up there, my last hurrah. He, him sitting up in the stands and me being like, fucking right, it's Louis DeBrus up there. Yeah. Good guy, always around. <laughs> always Louis, around the run. Louis, thanks for joining us, buddy. We're a big fan of yours. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me, guys. I even put Lou Dog as my name on the Zoom call, <laughs> so I got the dog at the end. <laughs> there you go. I'm, I'm, far, I'm part of the clan. I, I appreciate it. Let, let's start there with your telecast because, like I said, me and Updog watch a lot of Oilers games. You guys do a hell of a job. Uh, 
just talk about the chemistry you guys have and how much fun you're doing it because when we when it watches it looks like you guys enjoy every single game and it's probably easy when you're watching 97 and 29 most nights yeah yeah it's uh you know it's funny when i first started with evans there was a few dark years there when i say a few like almost a decade and I don't say that lightly because when I played for the Oilers, that was the first dark years for the for the organization after the Stanley Cup. So I understand what that was like. So I had some empathy for the team and what they were going through. But obviously in the last six, seven years, you've really started to see this team start to take on life. Obviously under Connor McDavid's watch and he and being the superstar that he is, he just knew this team was going to methodically get better and better and better. And now they're in the Stanley Cup final. Um, and, you know, I don't think too many people are that surprised they're there, but for Jack and I, you know, we've known each other since uh, he came on board and we've been friends ever since. And, you know, when you're friends with somebody off the ice, uh, off the ice, out of the broadcast booth, uh, it's it's easy to be friends in the broadcast booth. If that's so I mean, kind of how to say. So for him and I, we have a chemistry that way. We love calling hockey. We love calling games. We like seeing what's happening on the ice. We get excited for great plays. Um, and this team's had a lot of them. I mean, th- we, we kind of picture ourselves sometimes. We're sitting up there and, you know, Connor will do something he does, or Leon, or Nuge, or you name it. The players on this ice, some of the things they do out there on a nightly basis are just incredible. And it just doesn't happen all the time. So when you're when you're in it every single day, sometimes you can get desensitized from the great stuff. Yeah. And you have to really be aware of that. You have to be aware of the fact that, hey, these guys are doing amazing things right now. I mean, they're breaking records. They're 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 destroying records that have been around for a long time. So let's give them the bet. Let's give them that due and make sure that we're we don't talk about them because we think we're talking about them too much. We can talk about them a lot. No, that's such a great point. You heard Paul Maurice's comments about like how good 97 and 29 are, and you almost take it for granted, right? Like you just expect them to go out there and get three points. You expect them to 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 break yeah. records. It's like, man, what they're doing is is it's so crazy that this is oh, this is just normal. This is what Connor does every single night. It is there's a ton of weight with that, right? And I, I'm 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 completely aware of that. I know Connor's handled it really well, Leon's handled it well. Playing at a Canadian market, as you know, it's uh, both of you guys have been involved in Canadian markets and been around it. You understand what is what the animal is here in Canada. And it is different. I mean, we we live and breathe this game. Um, you're gonna see that when you come into the into Edmonton and taking a couple of games here for the Stanley Cup final. It's just a whole different situation and you have to be mentally and emotionally strong to handle it. So I give him a lot of credit because there's been a ton of pressure here. And when you're the best player in the game as Connor is, there's always going to be that expectation. It's destiny, right? It's uh, it's kind of when you're a generational player, you're expected to win. Simple as that. And I know he knows that more than anybody. That's the thing. We all talk about it. But this guy understands kind of what he is as far as the game is concerned and how, how you know, his impact on the game and what he's had as an impact on the game already. But he wants to win. He wants to be that guy. And, when you listen to Dreisaitl at the start of the year, cup or bust, I mean, I think every single player going into the season feels that way. I mean, he just said it, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. There should be expectations. That is a hefty expectation. But I think from their perspective, that's exactly what it is. They, they've had all the individual awards. They don't. It's Yeah, it's nice to get an Art Ross. It's nice to you know, go out there and get the Rocket Richard if you can be in that mix. It's nice to score 50 goals and get 100 assists, but for Otter and for Leon, and for the whole uh, core of this team, including Nugent Hopkins, who's been here the longest, it's about winning. That's what the game's always been about, and that's what they're trying to do right now. But, yeah, you know, I, I think that I've, that's probably the biggest thing for me is how they've handled that pressure. And every single year, it seems like they're able to come in and do a little bit more. And we've seen it again this year. Their first taste of the Stanley Cup final hasn't started great for the team, but um, they've gotten themselves there, and they've had a taste of it, and there's still lots of hockey left in this series. Uh, we all hope. I'll, I'll just stay there for one sec with with Connor um, Louis. Connor, I saw something Connor last uh, last series when he stuck up for you know the the media scrum when someone asked him about Nurse and playing better or whatever, and he and he just kind of took. He's like, "I'll take that." That was something I you know I've known Connor a while now. It was something I seen that I was like, "Wow, this this maturity level and him knowing like I've been to this you know Western Conference Final before. I didn't get to the yeah, I didn't get to the promised land. These are my boys." You're around him every day. Is there something right now you see like in, in his eyes or in practice or the way he handles his teammates that you haven't seen yet that you're like, you know, he realizes that all the greats get to this moment and that when they're so close, you know, the the margin of error is that much bigger. Like, is there something you see that that you're like that just still impresses you with Connor that 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 you haven't seen yet? You know what? I, and I would I would honestly tell you, I don't think it comes naturally to 
You know, that's the one thing. I think people just expect the, the best players in the game to be these superhuman beings that, you know, are confident and walk around and command that attention and command that respect. That's not necessarily always the case. I mean, I'll take Wayne Gretzky, for example. You know, he had other guys in that room in the 80s and they were winning Stanley Cups that, you know, like the Mark Messi of the world. He talks about Lee Fogelman all the time. You know, the older veteran player that just, you know, came to the rink every day, buckled down, played the right way. They respect those guys. And Connor's no different. He has a great respect for the grunts of the game. You know, <laughs> he really does. He understands that if you don't have those boxes checked up, you're not going to win, right? You know, it, let's face it. I mean, yeah. I was a grunt. I'm not afraid to say it. You know, the fourth line grind, but it's your fourth line or your third line or guys in your, your fifth and sixth, your third pairing are, are pulling their weight. You're not winning anything. I don't care who you are. And he understands that. So I think what I see in Connor, I see a lot of growth. He's gotten more comfortable in that skin of being the best player in the game. And it just comes with the territory. He's been really good in that regard. And I think you have to give him a lot of credit for that. Yeah. And Leon's come out of his shelter. He's a great interview. You guys know that. You see what he talks about. He speaks from the heart. He's not He's not going to pull a punch. If you ask him a question, you're going to get an answer. And I think that's kind of where they have to get to to, to understand that they're the leaders of this team, you know, and this is how they're going to have to do it. And for Connor, the one thing that I've seen is he has taken responsibility with that. He has taken that uh, stance on his team where I'm kind of tired of hearing you guys bash our team. Stop bashing our team. And we talked about it quite a bit throughout the year this year. The games have been tight. I mean, they're not blowout games, right? Like These have been very tight games. And yeah, in the end of the game, it seems to get out of control when you're you're trying to push and you're pulling your goal. There's an open net goal and all that, but that was the one thing this team really had to buckle down. They knew they couldn't keep playing the same way if they wanted to be successful. Now, they're putting up all these points. They're breaking records in the power play. They're, they're scoring titles and all that. But they understood that they had to buckle down to the team and play defense. And I think that's the biggest change that I've seen in the top players. And it's still a work in progress. They're awesome at it. They've gotten the Stanley Cup final. But there's still work to be done there. And I think when they play that way and they execute well, in the overall game is when they win hockey games. So that's what they're going to have to do in game number three if they want to win. And they know that. And that's, that's kind of that realization that, you know what, sometimes, and I always go back to like Steve Eisenman in Detroit, you know, Joe Sackett, who didn't drop off point totals as much as Eisenman. Those are the two guys back when I was playing, the, you know, Detroit, Colorado winning cups. And, you know, I just watched how they went from 150 point guys to 85 point players and they were better. They were better teammates and better players for it because they played the right way. And if you didn't play that way, you didn't play for the win. They just booted you out of there. It's like, see you later. We're not going to use you. And I think that's the mentality that Edmonton's trying to take over. It's taken some time because when you're the guy that's expected to put up three points a night, um, it's it's a pretty uh, heavy task to do. And you you want to win games 2 1 3 2 3 1 with an open letter. That's kind of what they're looking to do. Well, so. Louis, I might have to steal that. Need the grunts. I might make that a t shirt, buddy. You need the grunts, yeah. eh, bud? You fucking you need the you grunts, need boys. Grunts. Hey, hey, ham and eggers, buddy. Ham and eggers. <laughs> yeah. You got to be ham and eggers. You, you, if you don't have them below, I mean, listen, Florida, I'll, we'll talk about those guys. Look at them. Yeah. yeah. I, the one thing about Florida, and I will tell you in the last few days, I've seen them dismantle my, my son's Boston team twice, and that's not an easy thing to do because they beat him at their own game. Yeah. They were down 3 1 last year up against one of the best teams in history, and they found a way to grind out that win. Now, it punished them when they got to the final. They left it all on the table for the first three rounds, and it hurt them in the final. And they're healthier now. And it shows. And I think that what happened, though, is when they go up against the Boston's of the world, they're up against Tampa Bay every single year. Right? They're looking at them right there in Florida going, holy geez, that's a team we have to take over. It was in three straight Stanley Cup finals. You know you have to elevate your game. They've elevated their game, and they are a team. They're a great team. And I think some of their their role players and grunts don't get enough respect. Like yeah. That Lundell is great. Oh, that kid's he's awesome. He's so nasty. I'm telling you. He's suppressed right now. He's on a very good team suppressed, but that guy, he's a player. And that 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 makes all the difference when you're neutralizing top lines and you're trying to balance things out. When your depth plays the way their depth plays, you've got a really good chance of being successful. Hey Louie, I want to go back. I want to go back to the dog days at the start of the year. Just just from this is a personal question for me and up dog, because we're watching the Oilers. I'm like, Uppy, we gotta bet them again. There's no way they're gonna lose. They lose. I'm like, Uppy, we gotta bet them again. They lose. I'm like, Uppy, we gotta hammer them we again. Were on tilt, Louie. Louie, yeah, we when they right. lost that game at the shark when they when they lost that game at the shark tank, me and Up Dog were we hit rock bottom. But, but what was it like for you? Yeah. Were you guys just like what is like? What was it like? Was it just like, well, how do we just lose that hockey game? Where's our team? What was it like inside that organization? Yeah. It was, I will be honest with you, and from my perspective, because I talked about those 10 years that I covered the team where they had four first overall picks and 
I remember Kevin Quinn was my partner at that time, and I would <laughs> ten games into the season, I'd top him and say, "Saddle up, <laughs> this is be a long year again." Yeah, hey, you know what I mean. This is gonna be a long year. Like they're just they're just not there yet. They've got all these first overalls and trying to figure out how to play in the NHL. It kind of reminded me of that a little bit is what I felt. I felt, geez, this is a real kind of almost step back. But what I will tell you is, and I truly believe this, I just think all the talk in the summer, conference final, the year, two years before, lost to the Stanley Cup champions to Vegas Golden Knights last year where they pushed them harder than any team in the playoffs. They gave the Vegas Golden Knights the hardest time in that second round matchup last year. They lost it. But they pushed them. They had a lead in every single game of that series. So they were running right with the Vegas Golden Knights who went on to win the Cup. Then they go into this season, and the expectation from the conference final to last year losing the Stanley Cup champion again, they lost to the Avalanche two years ago. Bad. There's only one. The the next step is get to the final. Here we go. Give ourselves a chance to win this. And I really do believe that expectation took on a life of its own. And I think that it was really heavy. I do. And then things start to go south a bit. You don't win a couple games. You get up against a Vancouver team the first two games of the season that won the Pacific, you know, and they came in like gangbusters and just, you're like, wow, like you think you should be able to beat that team. That's a pretty darn good team like that. But people didn't see it that way. So I think the outside noise started to pile up and I'll give them credit. I, I've been around for a lot of coaches in this organization. I can tell you that. And the player, especially Ryan Nugent Hopkins, I think he's at nine, eight or nine for sure. Um, it's it, there's been a lot of turnover in that regard. And that's hard to see from anybody outside the game, but especially for those guys in the ring. You could tell it was a really tough situation having to let another coach go and bring somebody else in. And there was a little transition period, very short, but where they were like, okay, we need to start buckling down and getting things going here. That game in San Jose, though, I do remember clear as day because we, Jack and I were talking going, hey, you know, they can't lose this game. <laughs> like, this is kind of a team. This is a team where... It's time to start turning this around because you're digging yourself a hole that you might not be able to get out of. But give them a lot of credit. I don't think people talk enough about that. They were way down there, and they just climbed right to the top and now are one of the final two teams. Pretty impressive season in that regard, and I think you have to you have to think of it in those terms. They found a way to get there, which is the most important part. Yeah, I was going to say that. We had a close friend of ours during that stretch, and I think it was maybe after San Jose, you know, sent us the line on the on the you know the cup contender. They're like Edmonton's plus eighteen hundred right now to win. Is this something you should you should tickle? And I'm like, guys, they are at rock bottom. I would not even I would not even exercise it, you know. But uh, let's just let's talk about the coaches. What uh, that would have been. Yeah, uh, no I know, kidding. but God, Louis, they were so they were so, they were so in one. I'm like, I'm not touching this team. I'm not touching yeah, this yeah. team. Yeah, who would have that loan? I mean, that's yeah. reality. That's how it was. That's how they felt. But I'll give them a lot of credit. Those guys buckled down and uh, they ate a lot of crow. Yeah. They had yeah. a lot of uh, talk from us on the outside. And I think they used it as motivation. I really do. I think they used it as that that little bit of a, you know, on the shoulder. I always go from, you know, hey, get things going here. Every single time they started to think it wasn't going to go, they started hearing that noise, that voice on their shoulder and, uh, Good for them. Yeah. Good for them. I, did, I did say the up dog. I said, they're going to go on a run. I didn't think they'd win 16 straight, Louie, but I'm like, they are going to go on a run here, and we just got to catch it. And I caught like the last, I think I caught the last seven or eight wins of it, so I got a little bit of my cheddar back from the from the tough start. But it was an unbelievable run. Yeah, so, so I wanted, to, you just said motivation. What does this group, well, what motivates these guys? It's like, is the media sometimes, I, I never dealt with Canadian media like Obi and yourself has, and you're part of it, but you're not one of those guys. No. You're not one of those guys. Is there is there a you know d- inside that room? Do they use that as fuel sometimes? Do they you know when when all of a sudden like the hockey world and especially the the internal hockey world, the beat writers and all that? Do, is this a group that's always used that as motivation, or does it you know I, I don't know. I guess I'm asking what what really makes this group tick. I would I would tell you yes, but only to a certain degree. I think that uh, unfortunately, being in this you know I don't even know what you want to call it, but it's. Uh, you're under a microscope, no question about it. Yeah. And tell us, like it's like you know, like you're you're so everything you do, everything you say is scrutinized, is talked about. We're all armchair GMs here at Edmonton. I don't know if you know that. We all know how to make a winning team. Bob Stoffer. Bob Stoffer, especially Bob, Bob especially Stoffer. Bob. I myself in that too. We all think we know everything. Yeah. To be the ones in charge of doing that, you have to kind of quiet that outside noise. And I think you guys don't play as long as you did. Both of you guys did, like. That team is your world. That becomes your family. That becomes your world and everything on the outside. And you can look at it one of two ways. You can look at it as arrogance and however you want as far as being that group. 
I don't look at it that way. I look at it as survival. I look at it as, hey, if you were to actually open up the news page every single day back when it was newspapers, if you go on the internet today and you start looking at stuff, I mean, you're going to think you're a terrible player every single day. Yeah. You can't do it. So you have to block out that outside noise. You have to do it from within. You have to have those internal conversations. And I think that's another thing going back to when you talked about Connor. I really do believe that there's more of those conversations going on with this team. I think that, you know, the Zach Hyman's that have come on board, Corey Perry obviously adding him into the mix. The Dutch player is the oldest team in the league at the end of the year. So they've got guys that have been around and they've tried to build it that way to say, hey, this is our group right here. Of course, you have to engage the, the, the crowd and the fans, and they respect them a ton, but you can't hear all that noise all the time. You have to block it out and just be a team. And I think that's made them stronger. That's the motivation, Scotty, you're talking yeah. about, is that they want to do it for, for themselves first that will obviously lead to the outside and make their fans really, really happy. And, and good point on on motivation with, with veterans in your group because the veterans, like, throughout a playoff stretch, they realize, like, this could be it. This could be my last crack. Right. And that yeah. in your internal group can prove to the younger players. And Edmonton's been made up of a lot of younger players, you know, a lot of, you know, n- new yeah. players into the mix. And those guys don't really realize how hard it is to get, you know, the the first round victory or even to make the playoffs. And then yeah. by this time you have Corey Perry, you got Hyman has been there now. You've got, you know, nurse, you've got these guys that have been around going, guys, this is we're as close to this as we may ever get. Like now let's like use that mm-hmm. as the motivator and unless you got those guys pushing everyone you know you might just say ah oh, we got next year if this doesn't work out look at adam henry yeah, yeah. I, mean, I know you guys know adam right yeah of course he, he goes to the stanley cup final with the new jersey devils in his first full year that was his first goal since not playoffs sorry he scored one i think with uh against the all the kings in 14 that's a long time yeah. that's a long time 12 or 14 when they lost to the, the kings that was that year. Sorry. 12, yeah, right? it, was, it was his first year. I'm they beat all, us. I'm they... getting all messed up in all my... But anyway, what yeah. I'm saying is there is a guy that I've talked to this year when he came aboard, and he's got a great attitude. I mean, he's gone about his business every single year, but you start wondering to yourself, you know, I never won a cup. I watched a lot of guys win cups. I don't know about you guys, but you're watching every single year. You're like, that's what it's all about. I'm sorry. That's what you gauge your career on. You really do. And I think afterwards you can lighten up and understand you still did a great job even though you didn't win. When you're in the mix, when you're in that business, the business is winning. Simple as that. Yeah. You're there to win. And when you don't, I think people don't realize how hard they take it upon themselves. Um, I can use my kid, for example, in 19. I mean, he was wrecked in 2019. He lost to St. Louis. One year later, Scotty. One year. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, it's totally. a, that's timing, right? Yeah. But but you know as well as anybody, that's a tough place to get to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I knew that because I've been around the game for a long time, and I watched. I sat there and made sure I watched that celebration on the ice and watched St. Louis hoist that cup around because there were some great guys in that room that had never won to. Yeah. Right. And every single year, I say the same thing when the Stanley Cup is hoisted. It's an emotional time for anybody that's been around the game mm-hmm. because you're happy for the guys. And Conger said it best. When he knew he was 14 or 15 years old when he's watching the Stanley Cup be at a race, right before he got drafted, he said, but I was jealous. Yeah. I was jealous of those guys lifting that cup because that's what everybody wants, right? And I just think you have to have those guys that have been through those experiences to be able to say, like in a game like game number three coming up tomorrow night, hey, we need to buckle down. This is still a series, and we need to get back into it. And for the Florida guys, it had been around. The opposers of the world, which I, it's great to see him on board doing that. And the guys they picked up at the end and, and injecting their lineup. Terrence Seiko has already won a Stanley Cup. He knows. They know, hey, we can't give this team life. Do not give this team a step. That's that's the knowledge right there. Who brings it tomorrow night? Let's see what the series is at after three. Louis, I got to ask you, you, you made a great point. They got swept by the Avs after the conference a couple years ago. They lost to Vegas. And it always goes back to betting for me, Louie. I've, I've had money on the Oilers every year but this year because I just thought, when, when are they going to When are they going to learn how to play defense? When are they going to learn how to go score 3-1, 3-2, like you said? Now, I want to ask you about Paul Coffey. Uh, it was Coff and yeah. Knobloch, too, but does Coff been the guy that's come in here? How have they learned how to play the right way, Louie? That's my question. How have they learned to play the right way? I think it's been a progression for years. I really do. And I think every coach that's been there for those years has started to implement that and make them understand. Dave Tippett, I mean, I remember talking with him at length about it. I remember one conversation we had. And these coaches are smart. You know, honestly, I have such a respect for, from a player's perspective to a broadcaster's perspective of coaching, right? You know, you get a little older and you start watching, you're like, geez, you know, there's a lot of moving parts you got to take control of here. A lot of, a lot of different things you've got to, you've got to mix and match. 
Steve Tippett said one time, though, when he kept Rice out of McDavid, um, finally it separated them. And I asked him about it. He said, I had to put them together. Now, this was early when they weren't as deep as the team. But I have to put them together to, to let them understand that it wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to work long term by keeping them together. And the only way to really know that is to experience it, is to go out there and lose together. I know that sounds crazy, but you have to have that in your mind. Like, yes, you can put them together in spurts, and they're awesome. And you have to, you can use them in certain situations, and they do. And so does an all block now. But I think that it, it was it was a message to say if we don't balance this out and we don't play the right way, and we don't become harder to play against, then we're never going to win anything. And it takes time to embed that into the mentalities of players that have been able to go out there and pretty much do what they want their entire careers. Go out there and just, and just win the game for the team. It gets harder and harder to do that. So it started with Dave Tippett. No question about it. I think when he came on board, you know, this last like five years I'm talking about, right? Gene Woodcroft came in, did wonderful things. Look, look at his record when he first took over the team. You know, he came in and he started to implement stuff and then it was just a progression again. Chris Knobloch comes in with Paul Coffey, and you start to implement different things. I don't necessarily think there's been massive changes, to be honest. I think it's mentality. I think it's how you get the message across. I think, you know, Coff back there has a little bit of a pretty, he's a jokester, right? Like, I mean, he's always kind of cracking jokes, and he's very light, um, intense. Don't don't mistake that for not being competitive. Those, you know, those 80s guys are oh, yeah. competitive as anybody. They'll, they'll, they'll compete in anything. But it's, I think it's just finally when the message does resonate and you realize, and you'll see, like when they have difficulties, Edmonton for me is when they get off that path. When they get off that path, start getting run around, not being strong in front of their net, um, that's when they start to be porous a bit. And if, if the goaltender is not standing on his head, then you're not winning the hockey game. But I do believe that they'll bring that back to uh, a little bit more regular. But that's where it starts. It's been years in the making, though, honestly, for me, for this team. And if you look at any great team, I always look at the Tampa Bay Lightning. You know, they lost four straight to Plums Blue Jack yeah. before they won their first Stanley Cup. Well, second in, in their franchise history, but first from that core. And then they just learned how to do it. And sometimes you need that hard lesson to set it in stone. Yeah. Cost got a nice tan too, eh? Yeah. Cost, Cost got a nice tan. How does he keep that tan? How does he keep that tan yeah. going up there in Edmonton? He's always got a nice tan. He goes for walks. Yeah. That's what he does. He goes for like 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 him and Jack will go walk the city. Uh, I don't know how they do it. I get mall back after oh, like, two blocks. Louis, Louis, me too. Louis, me too. Yeah. It's it's oh, mall back or it's it's thing. bar back. I don't oh, know. Whatever. Yeah. 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 I don't know about you guys, but I go, my wife wants to go to the mall. We don't go that much anymore. But walk to the mall, I swear, it's like yeah. She's a machine. She can walk all day. Her and my daughter can go forever. I, I'm like, I'm just going to be sitting over here in this chair and her having a coffee. I'm yeah. not going to walk anymore because I got to put some good shoes on if you're going to walk around the wall, mall with your wife. Louie, I want to ask you about a guy um, who, I guess just your time in Edmonton, you know, even Dayton way back. Have you seen a guy come in and, you know, bring as much impact to Zach Hyman to like a group of guys? Yeah. And then just like, maybe just his success like the last couple of years and then throughout the playoffs, and then maybe how he can kind of break away from this Florida Panthers sort of defensive strategy against him. Because it, we really, we talked about it. He hasn't really been able to get get open in front of the net and get those opportunities. Yep. But but maybe just a little bit about him and, and who he is as a guy. And then, you know, what what's going to break out here at home for game three for him? It's determination, right? Like for me with Zach, whenever I look at him and I, you know, because I saw him in Toronto. I played against my kid twice, two seven-game series, I lost both of them. And he was good in those playoffs, but he was not the player he is now. Like he and you and again, that's that learning along the way. He puts the work in. Simple as that is how he's gotten better. I think he's and he's he's smart. He understands who he's playing with. He understands the situation he and the opportunity he had when he came to Edmonton. He saw that opportunity and he absolutely grabbed on with both hands and did not let go. And unfortunately for some over the years that I've been here covering this team, they have let it go. They haven't been able to maintain that. A lot of pressure playing with 97 and 29. A lot of pressure. But he's, he's he was the perfect fit for it. And I have him. To be honest, I think he's been one of the most explosive guys to come on the scene, to score 50 goals the way he did this year. Um, the work ethic every single night. I think he's a great leader and example for everybody else in that dressing room. And I do see some tendencies rubbing off on other guys. You know, other guys starting to spin with the puck the way he does on the line, the way he goes to the net, where are you going to score goals? Get to the dirty areas and score goals, right? And... You know, for him, though, the Florida Panthers, I think, I would say Matias Ekholm on a defensive side of it. Matias Ekholm was an amazing pickup last year. Incredible. 
I honestly thought they had no chance of bringing him on board. I, there were some rumblings that he might be the guy coming. I'm like, yeah, really? You think that the Predators are going to trade that guy? Well, lo and behold, they did. That was a great move. And, you know, you got to give Petty Hall a lot of credit for that. That's, you know, you know, you got to wait till the end. You make your pitch. You go out there. You get the player you want. I don't know if he could have picked a better guy at the price point he's at to come in and be that guy. So he would be the other equivalent for me in my time. I think so far, seeing guys come on board. Um, and then, you know what, for, for Florida, I think that's probably the biggest part of the game that we touched on earlier that people don't give enough respect for. They are a really tenacious, hard defending team. If you go back and watch replays around the net, and I do this all the time, my wife hates watching games and anybody that I'm watching, because I'm always rewinding, checking stuff up. It's the analyst in me. I can't, I can't help it. But I go down in the basement. It takes me four and a half hours to watch a game because I'm constantly reviewing stuff, watching stuff again. But if you watch them in front of their net, like they're just so focused. They're so focused on where the danger is. They don't get drawn. Like the one thing Connor's been able to do, Leon can do them with the way he holds on to the puck. Is those guys, Nugent Hopper, they can kind of sway into getting like puck watching one guy. And all of a sudden they'll draw a couple players to them. They don't do that. They don't do that. They protect the house as good as anybody. They're really, and they got a great goaltender. Sure. I mean, not only them, the guys protecting the house did a big, that Mikola kid. I mean, my yeah. son mentioned him because he felt his cross steps a few times in the series versus Florida. And he said, this guy is better than people think he is. This guy, you know, is going to make it hard for you to get in front of the net. They all do, though. Everybody's bound that way. How can you change that? I think, Scott, you just got to go and I really do believe you just got to will yourself to get to that spot. You got to get a little hungrier. I do believe that they could have a little more of a shot mentality. Obviously, game number two was a complete opposite of game number one. But I don't think in a series like this where the pressure, that the pressure of Florida to me has been outstanding. I cannot believe how fast they can get on a puck carrier, how they take your time and space away. And they do it to everybody. But the one thing, if you go back to game one, the first and second period, 25 to 12, I believe the shots were in favor of Edmonton. Yeah, they put the pressure up. It's hard to do that for 60 minutes, but from Edmonton's perspective, I think they have to think, we need to do this every single shift. We need to get all these guys and make them defend, defend, defend. And if you don't, and they did push a little bit in the first period there, they got the goal by home, they snuck one through, but Brosky, you're like, uh-oh, the dam is broken here. Well, you know what happened? They allowed them to kind of get back into the game and stabilize, and that 1-1 one, one goal was the turning point. It is done. Once they got that goal to tie, you saw Florida take over and start to get to their game. And it was like, uh-oh, there's no time and space anymore. They got to find a way to change that momentum in the game if they can. Louis, I, I want to ask you, going back to Edmonton here, Edmonton here, will they have last change? Uh, we don't know what's going on with Nurse. CeCe's going to be back in the lineup. And I know how good uh, at home has been unbelievable. Him with Bouchard's been unbelievable. Is there any way in your mind, Louis, with the home ice, with the last change that you would ever think about splitting up Bouchard and at home to kind of balancing it out with not knowing what's going on with Nurse? Or is that pair, yeah. in your mind, always staying together? They'll see time together for sure, but I think if Nurse can't go, you're going to have to spread the wealth out. I yeah. think you could you could try and be solid, especially up against the Barkov line. I would say, but then I look at it and I'll tell you when the Barkov line is neutralized, the Bennett line goes out there. I see Bennett line. I mean Rodriguez is taking all the face offs. I don't know what's going on with Bennett's hands still, but um, and there was Rodriguez then for for Hagee. They made a switch, eh? Like you know they have stuff a little bit for Hagee. Rodriguez has kind of made some switches that have worked for them. I think it's time for Evanson to do the same thing. I, I said this the other day after the game. I'm like, yeah, it's time. I don't see the dry cell light creating as much as they should. If you're going to keep Connor and Leon separated, you got to find maybe Nugent Hopkins or dry cycle. Find some. I think Fogel, you know, is a guy who's a healthy stretch. He came in, but the one thing he does is he gets on the four check. You know, he gets on the four check. He disturbs. He gets pucks back. And that's the key when you're playing with both 97 29. You need to get the puck in their heads. You got to go get it first to get it to them all. It can't always be them going to get it. If you get it in their hands more often than not, get to the right places, good things will happen. They haven't done it enough. But yeah, I agree. You know, Shane, I think that they're gonna I think there definitely could be a situation where they split that up to try and spread the wealth out a bit. Too many minutes for those guys. And, and you're gonna have rights and left back in the mix with CC going back in, which is also a positive three left, three rights. Louis, I want to ask you about the bottom six forwards. I I think Knobloch's done a good job of earlier in the playoffs, last round especially, shuffling the deck. To me, now there's two guys. Sam Carrick and Corey Perry, to me, have to be in the lineup every night moving forward. Is Knobloch shuffling the deck too much with the bottom six and overthinking this a little bit? Or, or what would you do moving forward if you were in that opinion? Because he has had guys in and out, which I think you know keeps him healthy. But as of now, for me, Carrick and Perry got to be in there. 
Yeah, the grit and swagger, right? Um, I like what I like when everybody brings to the table. I think I think it really is. If if I had to take a guess, because they haven't been directly around the team, but I would tell you that they want to have fresh legs in there too. I think what you saw in Game Two was a little bit of fatigue too. I think you saw a team that was starting to feel the effects of the long run, and Florida had just a little bit more of the tank, in my opinion. And I think the two days in between, in my opinion, are going to help Edmondson better. It just just because of how much time the Stars play. I think it's gonna it's gonna benefit Edmonton instead of Florida. It'll benefit Florida too. I mean, Barkov gets a couple more days of rest. Looks like he's gonna be fine and potentially gonna play Game Three. Um, but I just think with the top guys, especially playing as much as they play in Edmonton, that extra day is critical. It's critical just to recover a little bit more. But um, yeah, you know what? I, I I thought maybe Derek Ryan injected in just to add a little bit of speed. I thought even a guy like Sam Gagne, who I mean, Jack used to always say, you know, you could roll out of bed and score a goal. You know, and, and he does. He's just, yeah. well, he's just that veteran guy that knows <laughs> what to do. He just can really buckle down and give you that, give you that great game. And he's done that for Edmonton. I, I, I don't know if I want to say it's panic, but I just think that you're trying to find the right mix. You're trying to find a spark. And there's no question this team needs some depth scoring. They haven't had a goal by a forward in the series yet in two games. They got one goal by a defenseman. It's you know what they have to generate some offense. Now I know we talk defense all the time. They're not really giving up a ton of goals. No, this is a team that can put the puck in the net. They got to find a way to get to this guy. They have to find a way. They're not going to lose this year. That's a good thing to be said about. You can roll a bed and score a goal. <laughs> yeah. That was definitely not said about well, me, like, Louis. Yeah. Like uh, my, O'Brien yeah. can't get out of bed. You can't get this guy. Out of I bed. mean, look at his first game this year when the team was in the dumps. Uh, I yeah. mean, Sam yeah. came in yeah. and scored two, I think, and it was just like, oh, see, yeah. they, it was like the magic answer. I know. Just bringing a good bet. Almost like playoffs. In yeah, there. honest to God, it was. You know, he's a very well liked player on this team. But he's a well liked player in this organization, in the city. You know, he came in as an eighteen year old. Um, and for Sam, you know, for me, he's kind of one of those players that it's been great to see because he's had to change his game over the years, as we all have. You know, we're all different players when we come up through the ranks so that next thing you know, you find that niche that's going to get you to the league and keep you there. He's had to he's had to really work in different areas to be a better player to, you know, stay around the National Hockey League for over a thousand games. You know, that's that's pretty impressive. I'm sorry. That is that is one of those tip of the cats for me because you guys know it's a grinding, grueling lifestyle. Big and time. to go that long and be around the game for that long, you're doing something right, and you're committed. Might be a little punch they need. I, I don't know if they're going to do that. I'm just saying, thinking outside the box, if you want a punch, you want a spark, he'll give you a spark, no question about it, especially with the build. They'll be pumped to see him in there. I don't want to punish anybody, though, and I know that's hard to look at when you look at guys making mistakes in the playoffs. I mean, the the, the margin of error is so small. It just it's I, I don't know if in the two series that I did, even the Ranger – um, Carolina series, it would be like a split second mistake. It was in the back of it. Yeah. Like it's just, you just, you get punished when you make a little mistake nowadays. It's more glaring because it's the playoffs. And I know guys look at people and say, he, this guy can't play, but that's not the truth. It's, it's, there's a lot of moving parts there, but I didn't really answer your question. I don't know. I don't mind the shuffling right now because I think you're trying to find and you're, you're, you're putting fresh legs in there. I think energy is so important yeah, with I how intense that. and hard this game is being played right now. You got to have guys that can go. You got to go, 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 and the only way you're going to do that is by being fresh and using your bench. Louis, uh, I got to mention that y- you know your squad there at, at Sportsnet. You guys do a great job. You should get more airtime. All my Alberta boys say like we wish Jack and, and the boys get the Saturday night home games. Like it sucks when they take it, you know, coast to coast because Jack <laughs> just calls such a great game. But a guy on your squad, Gene Principe, who's been around forever. Yeah. What a guy's yeah, guy. I love, I love we all, I mean, I think every NHLer loves coming into Edmonton just so, you know, you get to yeah. see those the, those uh, curly locks and he comes in and he's always got a smile on his face. <laughs> um, how is his perception amongst, like, you know, the the city? You guys, you, you know, you've got such a good yeah. squad there. You're well-loved. Uh, what What's Gene mean to the city at Edmonton? He's a man of the people. Yeah. You know, he really is. And it's outstanding. Excuse me. He's a guy that you, he's like a fine wine. You appreciate him more the more you're around. Because you're like, this guy works hard. He digs up and flushes out stories. Um, he puts his spin on it. You know, the genisms and all that is puns. He loves the puns. But the thing for me is the way he treats people. You know, Gene is, I don't know if Gene's had a bad day in his life. You know, I know he has. But he's one of those guys that puts his best face forward every single day. He comes in, he treats everybody the same. Very, very well-liked person in this community. And especially around the team. I mean, he just... 
he's just so easy to work with. Glad to see him doing work and still working. And uh, I saw a commercial of his the other day, and uh, I'm telling you what, he's a great actor. He's an awesome actor because he's doing all these shticks and these spiels all the time and his openings and all this, putting all those the, the <laughs> right. costumes on and all that. He's acting all the time. And does he realize I see him in this commercial? I'm like, he might be the most natural actor I've ever seen. I actually texted him and said, that's outstanding. It's hilarious. But uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, great person. Great person first and foremost. He's been around this game for a long time and I'm happy for him. Yeah. I got to ask you about your partner, uh, Jack. What's his pregame like? Because I know, I know when puck drop starts, he's probably, <laughs> how many Red Bulls, how many coffees? Does he have a pregame now? Like, what's this guy like on game day? He's charged up, eh? I swear to God, this is the craziest thing. Doesn't drink coffee. What? I don't think I've ever seen him drink coffee. I don't think I've ever seen him have a cup of coffee. Like, wow. I, I'm, I'm sucking this back still. Like, yeah. I'm always sipping coffee throughout the day. Um, I don't think he's not a Red Bull guy. He doesn't do Red Bull or the, he just, you know what? He's just an energetic guy that brings it. That's kind of how he does it. Right. But yeah, he can, he has an energy level that, uh, you know what? It, uh, it brings you to a new level because it's, it's always there. And I think that's why the fans uh, are so drawn to him too. And he had some big shoes to fill here coming on board. You know, Rod Phillips, I mean, his, you know, it's up the, his games that he did in the broadcast booth are up in the rafters here. So, I mean, that's the shoes that he was filling coming and taking over from Rod Phillips on the radio side. Not too many people could have come in and had the impact he did, um, but he did. He came in and he won people over very quickly, and then you know transferring over to the TV was uh, pretty easy for him, and uh, he's done a great job. And We have a great time. We try and have fun. I think that's yeah, you the guys most do. important thing is, you know, we don't try, and I don't know about for, for anybody else would say it, but I don't try and try to be a know-it-all necessarily. I just want to have fun making an exciting game. I get excited as well. When I'm up there down the bench when I'm doing the bench bench side games, I, I get I'm I'm with I'm in the flow of the game like everybody else sitting at home watching. Trust me, I'd love to drop an F bomb every once in a while <laughs> um, with stuff that goes on. But it's just you're riding that wave of what's going on in the game. There's highs and there's lows. There's highs and there's lows. And I always say it's no different than us sitting on the couch watching a game on a big screen TV and talking about the game. We just can't swear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Louis, Louis, last one for me, buddy. I, I love the way your 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 son plays. I love his game. He's he's a throwback guy. Updog's got a beautiful baby boy Beckham now that's working on his one timer. For a guy that put for work on that one time, yeah, oh yeah, do it for a guy. Do it. That's a losing. That's a losing art. Yeah, for a guy who played in the league, how how joyful is it for you to go to the game, see your last name on the back of his jersey? And for me, that doesn't have any kids. When I when I see you in the crowd and watching him play, that's it's got to be pretty cool, right? Because I remember my dad saying. Once he saw me out there with the O'Brien on the back was one of his proudest moments. You know, I, I remember one of the first one of the first moments that that really hit me was I went in for a playoff game uh, during the season. Uh, I kind of shot in there, and that's been the hardest part, I'll be honest with you, because I'm in the world too, and Jake and I talk about it all the time. He's back in Edmonton. Now we've golfed a couple times together. and It's like, you know, he's in the world, I'm in the world. You know when you're in that world, it's going to be really hard to kind of go and see him live. So when I see him live, it's it's special. It's awesome. I'm still intense though. I want him to win. I want the team to win. I want them to do great. But I was coming up the escalator at TD Garden, and right in front of me there was a debruster. <laughs> I took my phone out. And I took that picture, and I'm yeah. like, it was just one of those things where you're like, that's really cool. Yeah. You know, it's cool to see that 74 debrust going up the escalator in front of me, and it's proud. You know, you're proud of your kid because yeah, I know what he's gone through to get there, just like you did. And, and both you did, and I had to do in a different way, but you, you found a way to get there. Getting there's one thing, sticking around is a different thing. You've got to really commit yourself because there's always people underneath that are always trying to take your job, and it's a really competitive world. But uh, I'm really proud of him. I think he's really studied uh, himself as a, as a consistent performer in the league, and he goes out there and just plays the game the right way. And I, every time I get to watch him, I'm proud of him. You know, I'm... Um, I'm tickled, but I've got to do some special things with him too. You know, the interviews, uh, bench side, to be in the building calling a game where he scored a goal is, you know, for me, it's I just, uh, yeah, I pinch myself because it's pretty cool. Not too many people get that chance. Yeah, you're right. No, it's awesome. But a- uh, any insight where he wants to go play next year? Or, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, hey, listen, he, if but, if uh, I'm a GM right now, uh, I'm looking. His name is highlighted at the top of my list. His if I was highlighted at the top of my list, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it's, it'll be interesting. He's worked hard to get here, and we'll see what happens in the next month before free agency opens up if something gets done or not. And um, it's his call, though. I think he's I, – I haven't talked a ton with him about it, to be honest with you, because I 
he was 27 now. And I'm like, listen, you, it's, it's the most important thing is where you're happy going. The most important thing is what you're in your situation individually, it has to be good for you. And it has to be a place that you feel comfortable and you feel good about going to if you do go somewhere else. And if you stay, that's fine too, but that's your decision. And we all have to make those decisions, guys, right? Yep. You have help. I'll give him input here. His agent will as well. People he talks to, but it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what, what happens in the next few weeks here to, to open up free agency. And, but I do know that he's, he's nervous, but he's excited at the same yeah. time. He's super excited about the opportunity maybe to see what the league thinks of him. And, you know, if it ends up going back to Boston, it's a place he's very tough. He's a brilliant, don't get me wrong. I mean, yeah. He's played in that organization for eight years. And if you watch the way he plays, it's, you know, not everybody can play that system, by the way. You have to be a certain type of individual to buckle down and play that kind of hockey. And that's why certain teams pick up certain players. And Boston has a knack of kind of finding those guys that can step in and play that way. Yeah. I, I hope you, I, I mean, I think the Bruins should hang on to him. But if not, tell him to have his ringer on July 1st because it's going to be ringing off the hook <laughs> if you ask me, Lee. But hey, you're, you're great for the game, buddy. Honestly, keep doing your thing. You're great for hockey. You're a beauty. Updog, thanks for getting you. But, Louie, enjoy game three and four. If you see the updog up there, yeah, keep him out of yeah. trouble, eh? Keep yeah. him out of trouble. I'll hit you up. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll try, I'll try and bump into you somewhere there, maybe. I'll even try and take you to game in the next couple. So, uh, yeah, awesome. Well, thanks, guys, for having me on. Appreciate thanks, Louie. Yeah, good chat.